I'm Dan Reamer. I'm the Director of Entrepreneurial Programs for the College of Engineering. I'd like to welcome you to the last in a series of the Entrepreneurial Lecture Program. Uh, we're uh, wrapping up this in this academic year. Of course, we will start again uh, in, uh, in the fall and September. Uh, we're delighted to have the return of Donald Stevens, an architectural graduate in that class of 1992. Uh, he was here last year. He shared uh, his entrepreneurial journey and his experience in, uh, in Haiti. He's here this year to bring us up to date, to let us know what's happened and maybe even what hasn't happened. Uh, he can share the, uh, the challenges they've had. Uh, it's a very interesting experience and I'm uh, really looking forward to his presentation again. Uh, he had commented to me today at lunch that he really enjoyed being back on campus. I also would like to uh, mention that we also have uh, one of the officers of our collegiate entrepreneur organization, William, is here. You can just wave your hand if, you, if you'd like and mention that's William. He's one of the officers of our collegiate entrepreneur organization. Yeah, also like to welcome our CEO members here. This uh, event is actually uh, co-sponsored by the Collegiate Entrepreneurs Organization, the Lawrence Tech Chapter, and the Legends of Lawrence Tech. Uh, the Legends are a uh, new organization on campus, relatively new. Uh, we have about 918 entrepreneurial alumni, and we're delighted to have uh, our entrepreneurial alumni uh, come back to campus. And those of you that are in the room, welcome back to campus, and we look forward to, uh, to continuing to be involved in the university. Uh, we, we also have uh, uh, with us uh, Dr. Ewan uh, Jensen, our associate provost. We're, thank you very much for. <laughs> that was a past advancement, associate dean. <laughs> associate, associate dean. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> and also uh, Professor Phil Walters with our architectural engineering uh, program. Uh, hopefully, I got that one. Right. <laughs> and uh, our uh, our uh, uh, entrepreneur in residence, uh, Padam Mazumdar, is also uh, here with us. And uh, uh, John Carpenter is here from our civil engineering program. And uh, just wanted to have everyone here. Sorry if I missed someone, but hopefully not. So, with further, without further ado, I'd like Donald Stevens to share his uh, journey with us. Well, good afternoon. Thank you, Don, for that uh, gracious uh, introduction. And uh, it's great to be back here at Lawrence Tech. Um, I'm a 92 graduate from the School of Architecture. Um, it's great to be back because um, I always, it's, it, if you know me as a, as a, as a I'm, I'm kind of a private person. I, I, I like to talk, but I don't like to talk about myself. And, uh, and so it's a great opportunity to share a little bit about my journey. It's, it's, it's what I think, it's what I've done in the past that's, that's brought me today, and it's brought me into Haiti, and it's brought me to uh, different places of the world. I also want to thank um, Melissa Grunau, um, who has been assisting our nonprofit reach um, with our uh, past and upcoming LTU alternate spring breaks. And these are happening um, right now. Well, one happened last year, and we have four coming up that uh, Lawrence Tech students can participate on, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So it's great to be back. Thank you very much. Um, so what I like to do this afternoon is really talk about how I became an entrepreneur, you know, going back from the beginning when I was a little kid and, and just share some personal stories with you. You know, I, me I mentioned this stuff to you um, because it's, it's, it's kind of shaped me to, to who I am today. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of what life is about. It just keeps shaping you along the way. You know, I'm not suggesting that you do these things. You know, I'm not an advocate, but, you know, maybe if you hear some of the things that I've done, it's, um, it, it might set a trigger in your mind so that when an opportunity may present itself, like the opportunities that have presented to me. Hey, Tom, how are you? Welcome. <laughs> you know, maybe it'll lead you to taking an entrepreneurial step, you know, and, and breaking out on your own and, and doing something that you, you know, might not think you had it in you to do. So, so my next, I have a question is like, how many of you have a, a personal mission statement? And you can just raise your hand, okay? And I'm assuming that the rest of you don't. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to inspire you today. Can everybody see all right? Let's see what's going on here. OK. Mission statement is a phrase commonly used to refer to a goal that someone or something has for set, for set, uh, set for themselves, consisting of one or two sentences briefly stating what the ultimate goal is. 
from an entrepreneurial point of view, I believe that this is a must. I mean, everybody's got to have a mission statement. I don't care who you are. I mean, it's going to give you, um, it's, going to def it's going to define what you're doing. It's going to help you navigate through the course of life. You know, otherwise, you know, you might miss what you're trying to achieve. You know, you're trying to become an architect. You know, well, what's your mission statement as an architect? As an engineer, well, what type of engineering do you want to do? So this is my mission statement. I made up this mission statement when I came to Lawrence Tech. It was pretty simple. You know, as an architect, I want to provide architectural designs and building solutions that influence, but improve in a positive manner the way people live. So that's what's in the back of my brain since I was at school at Lawrence Tech. And as you go through life, you, 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 you can't help hearing that voice in your back of your head. And it's really kind of helped me stay on the right path. And, and it's interesting, you know, how much your mission, mission statement will play. You know, I, I just look back today and it's like, wow, you know, if I, if I didn't have a mission statement, where do you think I'd be? So let me give you some background, personal background, just so you know who I am as a person. Yeah, I'm 41. I'm married. I got four kids. I was born in Maryland. I came to Lawrence Tech. I spent five years busting it, trying to get my bachelor's of science. You know, um, give you a little bit about my work history. So... I'll talk a little bit more later, but you can see I've, I've done a variety of things. You know, so I told you I graduated in 1992, so I've kind of been on my own since 94. You know, so in the true spirit, an entrepreneur. When, um, I, was, when I was a little kid, I knew, I mean, probably from eighth grade, I knew I wanted to become an architect. You know, on the back of my parents' property, we had built this, um, this, this tree for it, me and my friend did, and it was like three stories, and we used to spend our weekends out there. It was, it was all about the tree fort, building stuff with our hands, designing something, coming up with designs of, you know, you know, as a little kid, you know, give me a hammer and a nail and I'll, I'll do anything with it. You know, today I've been, um, you know, throughout the United States, I've been to 20 countries, I've been on four continents. I say this not to impress you, but just the fact that, that some of my travels internationally, looking at the architecture, studying the architecture, seeing how people live, has definitely have put me in a place where I'm, um, you know, I'm influenced. You know, um, so I share this story, so maybe perhaps in, it'll inspire you, you know, tomorrow or in the future, again, you know, to take that entrepreneurial step forward, to think outside the box or beyond, the, you know, the status quo, especially out of your comfort zone. You know, because there's so many people out there that are doing the predictable. They're going to go to school, they're going to get good grades, they're going to go out and get a job. But what are you guys going to do, you know? What are you going to do to separate yourself? Because as an employer, you know, I'm, I'm looking. I'm keeping an eye out for people that are doing extraordinary things. And we'll talk about what I think is extra, extraordinary. You know, and, and there's so much opportunity here at Lawrence Tech. You know, reminiscing, walking through the halls again. Um, Sam and I were walking through, um, you know, halls. It's just, you know, the school was a little smaller, not as many buildings, but, you know, the spirit here is, is it, it's, it's alive. So I came to Lawrence Tech in 1987. It took me, as I said, five years to get my bachelor's of science and architecture degree. You know, I can relate to all the architects. Out. How many architects are out here? Great. Um, you know, staying up three days straight, no sleep, you know, wired on Mountain Dew. Now I have to say that we didn't have that, that Zolt or Jolt or the Red Bull. So we had a little disadvantage, but, you know, we made it, we made it through. You know, um, I remember sitting back in the auditorium and hearing the Dean of Architecture saying, you know, well, you know, 10% of you will not make it next year and blah, 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 blah. And by the time you're, you know, you're, you're a fifth year student, you'll be lucky to have 10%, you know, and it, and it, it is a very, it's a, it's a competitive thing. Um, and so, you know, I understand what you guys are here, why you guys are here. Um, I have some friends here that are um, from engineering, you know, heard their journeys, um, just as painful as, as those architects. God help us. In my, uh, in, you know, my second year, I was kind of missing something. You know, I'm, I was missing the social side of school. Yeah, I spent a lot of time, you know, buried in the books. And so, you know, I was letting my, um, you know, my, my college experience just kind of go. You know, it was, it was disappearing. And so I, I met, met some guys from this fraternity. There was a fraternity here called Sigma Phi Epsilon. And um, got, I, got, I went skiing with them over, the, over a weekend and got to know some of the guys. And I decided in my third year that I'd rush to fraternity and join. And I just needed to, I needed to do something else besides just studying. You know, it was, my, it was my inner self telling me, it's like, you know, it's just not all about studying. You know, there's other things about being social, you know, building relationships and things like that, which are very important these days. And so third year I joined the fraternity. And, I, and looking back today, it was, it, it was the best move I made. 
I mean, it's, it's really allowed me to um, engage in more philanthropic opportunities because the fraternity is constantly doing stuff. They're raising money for this charity. Uh, they, have a, they have a volleyball marathon that's coming up, and they're raising money for our nonprofit organization that I'm involved in. So it's great to have these um, young men um, engaged, you know, whether it's cleaning up a highway or giving blood or something. You know, again, that's like, to me, is, is, uh, that's the icing on the cake. It's going above and beyond the good grades. You know, the, it, it's also allowed me to build a, a, a very good network of people. Um, you know, uh, with me today is Sam Michelli. He's a, a, an LTU grad, uh, you know, architecture student, SIGAP uh, brother of mine. He went to school, you know, after me. Uh, he's now uh, my director of uh, development and, uh, for our company, Shelter to Home. And he's helping with a lot of programming and, um, for our crews down in Haiti. And, um, you know, it's great to be able to, you know, know that you're bringing on people that, that, that have the training and the qualifications to do the job. And, you know, you know it feels good that, you know, I could pick anybody from Lawrence Tech and know that they're qualified to do so. I uh, also got about, you know, I know this isn't all about SIGET, but just to tell you that some of these guys that, that you know, do extraordinary things, they go out, they, they, it's beyond school. You know, we have about six guys that are volunteering, six SIGETs that are volunteering on our organization. So, you know, it's a very active group, and it's great to have them all on board. Let's see, let me move through. Um, one of the other points, and I'm just, I know I might be repeating myself, but again, you know, we're all here, we're all struggling to get good grades, but what else are you going to do? When your resume comes on and lands on my desk, is it just going to be 4.0, 4.0, 4.0, whatever? Or is it going to have some of these other extra, uh, extra things? Are you going to be able to say that, you know, I've done something internationally or I traveled abroad or I, I, um, I volunteered at my local Habitat for Humanity chapter, you know, helping put siding on a, on a house or whatnot? Okay, so moving on. So why entrepreneurship? You know, so when I graduated, I, um, I wanted to get my master's degree. I wasn't done with school. But, um, you know, the cost at the time was like another 40 grand just for a year for me to get money, you know, uh, to get through school. I didn't have the money, so I, um, I, I got out into the job market. It was 1992, and it was a very tough time. You know, the, market, the economy was just nobody was building. I was able to manage to get a job at an architecture firm up in Frederick. They offered minimum wage, which is at the time $4.10. Fortunately, my you know, sharp negotiating skills got me up to a whopping $7. You know, <clears throat> so I worked for this firm for a year. You know, I was green as can be. Um, couldn't even complete a set of um, working drawings, but you know, I had some good guys helping me out. And over the time, um, you know, I, got, um, I moved on to another company. And it ended up getting fired by this company because, you know, he wanted me to build his uh, uh, computers. Uh, and AutoCAD was just coming onto the scene. So um, I, I thought it was a great opportunity to stay on the cutting edge. You know, my, my t at my time, AutoCAD was just in its, really in its infancy. It was like a version 11 or something. And the computers were like 386s and stuff. <laughs> Crazy stuff. And so, <clears throat> so I, I, as I said, I ended up getting fired um, by this company because, of, you know, it's just, it wasn't working out. You know, I was not doing what I wanted to do. And, and to, to the next point is, you know, if you're not doing what you want to do, it's time to move on. You know, quit, find something that, 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 that's going to bring passion in your life, that's going to give you the reason to wake up in the morning and keep you up at night. And, um, and you're going to have, you're going to be much happier than a job that you hate. And then, and then losing all that time. So I ended up moving on to this other job, um, hired, hired this other guy, this other guy hired me and, and we were doing some work, but he stopped paying me. So I went for two months without, without getting paid and I said, this is, a, this is it, I'm, I've had enough. So I left, you know. Next thing I know, I get um, my phone's ringing at home. And getting back to the point of why entrepreneurship, my phone rang and it was one of my clients, one of his clients that was calling me to finish up the job because he wanted me to do it, not this other guy. And so um, in, the in the basement of my parents' house, I started my own design business. Don, Don A. Stevenson says it's how original. But, you know, um, that, was, that, was a, that was an exciting time. I was 25 years old and, uh, you know, everything was in front of me. And, 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 and I, I look back, I've been on my own since that time, so, you know, it's... It's, it's something to be an entrepreneur, you know, to hammer it out on your own. So 
Let me ask you another question. How many business students are, are here right now? Is any business student? Fantastic. How many of you are taking business classes? How many, how many of you think you should be taking business classes? Everybody's hand needs to go up because if, if you don't understand business, there is no chance for you to be an entrepreneur. You will stumble and fumble and you'll make a lot of mistakes. I made those mistakes. I had one business class here and I wish I would have had more because you know, it, it, at the end of the day, you can take your training and at any time, you can, you know, if the economy goes bad, you can, you can break out and do your own thing. And you can make a dollar stretch a lot further when you do it on your own time, under your own shingle, than underneath somebody else. Uh, there's a lot more tax advantages and stuff, but I'm not here to talk about, tax, about, about that. So two people have motivated me to take, um, to take these steps and to be an entrepreneur. You know, my dad and my uncle highly influenced me, and both business owners. But when I was younger, I was actually a little embarrassed about what my dad did. You know, all my friends had, you know, their, they had career jobs and stuff like that. Well, my dad was a janitor. He had a janitorial, comp janitorial contracting company. He cleaned toilets, office buildings, windows. He, he mopped floors and stuff like that. And I, and I was embarrassed. I didn't tell anybody. And as I got older, I realized what my dad was able to do. He, was a, he, he got out of the Navy and um, he had a high school education and he started his own business. He started with a mop and a bucket in Washington, D.C., cleaning out a bar, a, the bathroom hall of the Brownstone. But, you know, his company is still going right now. I, mean, I don't know how many years. It's, he started in 1966. He had over 200, and at the height, he had over 275 employees. And, and as an entrepreneur, you have the ability to have these, the flexibility to do things that most people don't get. And I'll just tell you another story. When I was in second grade, I have two older brothers. He took uh, my mom and the five of us left. He bought a motorhome and, and we went around in this Winnebago for three months touring the whole United States. I've, I've been to you know, almost every state except for Hawaii and Alaska. And we did that over three months. I mean, how many people do you know these days can take a three month vacation? Well, I can tell you an entrepreneur can do that because you, know, you set your time and you set you, you know, what you want to do, when you want to do it. All right, moving on. One of the other things that my dad was able to do is, is and we're going to talk about family time and stuff, is, is he spent time with his family. My dad was very active, you know, with us and stuff. So, was, you know, I think that was, you know, having, a, you know, my dad around a lot was, was, was a, quite a blessing for me. So, you know, and I have four children and I understand I travel a lot. I'm overseas and it's, and it's tough. So, you know, being able to spend the time, you know, with my family when I want to spend it is, is something that, you know, again, you have a lot more control being an entrepreneur. So again, well, some of us are made to be employers and some of us be made employees. I'm not, I'm not saying you know, one is right and one is wrong or you know, look down upon it. You're, you're just saying there's times, to, there's times to lead and there's times to follow. You just have to pick wisely on when you want to do these things. All right. So you know, as I'm going through, as I'm going through my life, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm keep coming back to my mission statement. You know, you know, what am I doing that's keeping me on track? You know, and how am I how am I designing and building things that affect people in a positive manner? So a challenge al along the way, and what we did for meeting them, addressing the world reluctant to change is by far one of the greatest obstacles I face in my professional life. I mean, you hear most people talk about uh, changing and, and being open-minded. I mean, most people aren't open-minded. Most people don't want to change. You know, they they're happy with the status quo, and that's just the way it's going to be. And the sooner you can realize and accept the fact that most people are not going to change, you know, and the more majority of us don't care to, you know, the, the better, better off you're going to be. This is going to save you time and money. All right, next question is, is how, many been, how many of you have had a chance to travel outside the United States? Okay, and how many of you had a chance to travel to a third world country? Okay, most, most of us in this room will not have the opportunity to see how 70% of the world goes. And the places where I'm talking about are not travel destinations like Europe. You know, I'm talking about Africa. I'm talking about Haiti. I'm talking about some of these, you know, Honduras. You know, and, and, and life is rough in some of these places. I've, I had a chance to travel a couple years and, um, and see some of these things and see how class, classes are separated by different types of languages. In Haiti, you know, if you're speaking French, you know, you're the upper class. If you're speaking Creole, you're at the bottom of the barrel. Another point, um, uh, you know, as an entrepreneur, there comes a time when the, you have an opportunity to develop into intellectual property. 
in the late 1990s, I was, you know, was, I had a client that came to me and wanted to design a uh, four-story hotel overlooking DC. I was like, great, you know, big steel beams and postmodern design. I was all excited. And he's like, oh, no, 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 we want to we wanna do, you know, like drywall studs, metal studs. I'm like, well, you can't build structures with that. You know, I was, I was trained, you know, wood framing here in school. And so what happened was, um, it was I wrong. I mean, you know, you can do a lot of these things. So I started investigating into this, this product, light gauge galvanized steel. And, um, you know, today we build most of our commercial buildings out of it. You know, it doesn't mold, rot, it doesn't burn. You know, it's highly recyclable. It's a great, it's a great product. I'm thinking, wow, we, we should be building every single house in the United States with this, this product. Why are we still building wood? You know, as I looked into the technology, I noticed that, you know, a lot of uh, builders here in the United States were attaching the same um, materials that the steel framing as they do wood framing. So they're putting drywall and plywood on the outside. So it's like, you know, you're taking this, this you're taking this uh, and pull on the, the car like a Ferrari engine and you're putting a Yugo shell around it. It's like, well, that doesn't make any sense. You're going to have this high performance engine covered up with a crappy, you know, covering. And, but you got to understand that um, um, there's, no, there's no logic in that. You know, why, you know, so I, I, my brain was thinking, how are we can develop a system that is going to be uniform, that can serve, you know, the cultural requirements on the outside and then also on the inside? Because today it's a dangerous place. I mean, you know what's happening in Japan. You know what's happening you know, in Haiti. You know, we're, so many examples where we need to do more sustainable, more better job building buildings and, and houses. I mean, people's lives are at stake. So <clears throat> I did some traveling in 2003 and 2004, you know, trips to Mexico, Chile, Ecuador, Brazil. I mean, I found out in these trips about 70% of the, wor of the world uses th uh, these products, cement, sand, steel, steel in the form of rebar. And there's a logical reason why we still use wood. I mean, it, it comes back to our ancestors when they got off the boat, you know, the pilgrims, they didn't have their mason with them, so they started chopping down trees. And since that first tree fell, that's been part of our culture. It'll always be part of our culture. The chances of us getting rid of wood framing, even though if that product came to market today, it would, it would not make one building code at all. Not a chance. I mean, it burns, it rots, termites eat it. It's extremely, you know, it's just, it's not sustainable. I mean, people tell you it's sustainable, but, you know. Uh, I, 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 but it, changing, you know, the way the, the culture and stuff like that, again, is a, is a very hard thing. Um, <clears throat> okay, I gotta take a sip of water here for a second. So sometime um, back in 2000, I was sitting in bed one day and I was just thinking all these ideas are coming into my brain and I sketched out a detail. I sketched out a wall section and what, I, what came up with was some concepts. And I didn't know what I had had. I sat on it for about a year. You know, I showed some, showed an architect friend of mine and he's like, yeah, it's novel, interesting. I don't know how it works. And um, I look at it this way. I didn't design, I didn't invent a tire. I, I, maybe I designed a better tread. And in my opinion, I think it's a great tread. It can go through anything. And, um, but in 2001, I filed a provisional patent, you know, and I went through that experience, you know, um, and what I ended up is filing a patent on what I call, it's a panelized light gauge steel framing and high strength structural stucco building system. Okay, so basically what it is, it's a steel framing system with a proprietary lath design that encapsulates, sets into the framing system onto which you put this um, uh, structural coating. There's a couple other things in there that I've removed just so that you can understand the, the drawing. So we, um, in 2002, um, one of my high school friends and I started a company called Stuck on Steel and we set out to break into the, the housing market and we were doing some, you know, some custom homes and stuff for some pretty high-end clients. We got into some contracting. We did a, you know, 67,000 square foot building for 250 FBI agents, part of Homeland Security. It was really cool. I had all the clearance stuff. And, um, yeah, but the largest home that I uh, designed, actually, let me, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this. So this is a section of, of, of a building. These are some, these are some wall panels. So it's a panelized building system. So we have these machines, and I'll show them to you. And I think it's on this timer, so I hope it's not going to do its own thing. I hope it stops. Okay, cool. If it, if it advances, let me know. 
So um, uh, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna, I'll skip past. I don't think the, the, the technology is that too important. I think uh, we'll, keep, we'll keep moving. But um, you know, this, this is the, one of the biggest houses that we designed, so one on the top. And um, you know, it was a high-end client. You know, I was at the time, I was really kind of disillusioned. You know? right here I am busting my butt for people, and it's like the gratitude. You know, it, I don't know, it was fun, exciting, but then it was, something was missing. And um, this is another house that's on the bottom. The bottom of the house, from the foundation up, the foundation is like age panelized steel. Okay, there's no, there's, no, there's no block in this house. You know, there's some plywood for some floor sheathing. Everything else is, is our system. This is by far one of my greatest accomplishments. It's a little 500 square foot house that I built in Sri Lanka um, after the tsunami. This is where my life changed. Um, and, and, and this is really what I think has brought me to, you know, to, to you here today is this, is this accumulation of, of things that I've done. And, um, I'll tell you a little bit about the mall. The mall was a fisherman, 39 years old, when the tsunami struck, and um, his house was right there. It just washed away, and um, I rolled into the scene with our our partner, Habitat for Humanity, Sri Lanka, and um, 20 days later, he had that house. And um, I mean, talk about an emotional roller coaster. Um, I went back to visit the mall a couple years later, and. Um, you know, it's just it's just unbelievable experience to to be able to give somebody a home and and and, and it drastically improve their their life. So the question is, is you know, how did I get over to Sri Lanka? You know, so the next step, the next part of my my presentation is 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 what I call taking a step to social entrepreneurship, and I'm doing that through um, an organization called Reach. So you're thinking, well, here's a guy, he's, he's about making money. I was, yeah, I'm about making money, but I'm also about get, you know, helping people along the way. If my technology can be used to help people, then great, then I've served my purpose. I meet my mission statement. You know, making money is just icing on the cake. So how many of you, another question, how many of you actively volunteer? Okay, great. Whether it's at a soup kitchen, where it's at church or a charity, you know, people that volunteer, th th those people are extraordinary to me. And, and as, a, you know, as an employer, I'd hire you over someone who, who came to me with, higher, with even a higher GPA because that just shows you, you know, the type of character you have. I mean, grades are great, but it's, it's what else? You know, you know not what I'm saying is not going to make sense for everybody, you know, but for people like me who, and, you know, this makes sense. So, you know, you might, might find some employers that don't, don't care, but that's okay. That's, that's, that's their, their thing. So, you know, in high school, I did all the, you know, I worked in the soup kitchen. I, I, I volunteered. You know, my dad was very influenced. So, uh, you know, I think that's what moved me along. So when I came to college, when my professor, Professor Means, who was my HVAC professor, offered to take me down to Detroit to help vinyl si hang vinyl siding for the Detroit chapter of Habitat, I raised my hand and off I went. You know, I ended up, um, our company, Stuck on Steel, um, helped with the Winchester chapter. I've always had this little relationship with Habitat, and I went overseas and was working with them over there in uh, Sri Lanka. So <clears throat> December, 20, um, December 26, 2004, um, you remember where you were? You know, it's Christmas time, you're probably home with your family. Well, that's when the uh, Southeast uh, Asia struck um, Indonesia. and. Um, it was horrific. I mean, you know, you see what's happening over in Japan today. I mean, yes, yeah, a lot of devastation, but we're talking over 250,000 people were killed and just a matter of, of like that. You know, uh, hundreds of thousands of people were displaced. Hundreds of thousands of homes needed to be built. 33, I saw these signs everywhere, little kids. It's heart-wrenching. Look, more, more young, young people living in these little tents and stuff. I mean, I could close my eyes and open my eyes up. Like, this is, besides the look on their faces, you know, this is, this is Haiti. This is where I work right now. So when, there, when the tsunami happened, I'm like, you know, what can I do? I needed to get involved. You know, my mission statement was driving me to do something. You know, I got this, I got this technology. I'm sitting on it. How can, I, how can I help? All these houses need to be built. I got a great system. So I started, my partner and I started this uh, nonprofit. And our mission was simple. Again, gotta have a mission. Otherwise, what the heck are we doing? 
and our mission is to provide homes for orphan children who have been affected by natural disasters, war, and poverty through collaborative partnerships with other organizations. So I found myself in, in uh, Sri Lanka 80 days after the tsunami, and I was meeting with some of the largest NGOs, um, you know, Habitat for Humanity, Sri Lanka, you know, and um, we ended up uh, collaborating on the construction of this house. Um, we were going to build two houses, and it was part of a give and, and set ourselves up for an opportunity to potentially open up a business. One of my first meetings was with the uh, Sri Lanka Builders Association, and, and you know, the, the, the president was telling me about all the, the housing deficits and, the, and how many men that they had and what their workforce could handle. You know, they, they, they thought they could just build about 5,000 houses. Well, 100,000 houses were destroyed, but their current skilled workforce could handle 5,000. So if you do the math, it's like a 20-year rebuild. So how are they going to scale up all the training, training and stuff to, to build, you know, the 100,000 houses? You know, it takes them two to three months to, two to three months to build a house like this out of, out of bricks and black blocks. And, you know, it's, it's no better off than what was destroyed in the previous tsunami. So it's not like they're building, some, building it back better. They're just building it back. So, and plus there's all these shortages. Two of the three building materials, there are shortages of sand and cement. All right, so I want to show you what I did. So what we did is we manufactured some components. That's me with the hat on. We shipped them over to, to Haiti. I hired a bunch of kids. And some of these guys that are standing around, or I call them my like sidewalk supervisors. They're just the guys in the neighborhood who just come by and just stand here and watch you. I, w I, I told the national director of, ha um, of Habitat, I said, just send me a bunch of kids. I'll show you I can build it with kids. I don't want skilled labor because I didn't want, the pre I didn't want these guys coming in and saying, you know, I know how to do all this stuff. I'm this guy. You know, there was a couple guys that, 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 wor that I worked with, and you know, they, were, they were more of the the wood carpenter type, and, and they were the slowest guys. These young kids, they just picked this stuff up like that. This is Nima and I after setting uh, the first corner of our building. So a system, you know, is, is, can be manufactured at the site or it's manufactured in a facility, shipped to the job site where it's erected. Roof is a panel. Everything's a panel. You know, panels go together. And um, it's, it's highly earthquake and hurricane resistant. And it, and because it, our system, our structure is actually encapsulated into the foundation. I got another couple slides I can show you. Then we encapsulate it with this high strength structural stucco. So it looks and feels like cement block. So culturally, from a design standpoint, once your house is built, you can't tell what it's made out of. When you go up and you knock on it, it feels like what they're used to. So going into these third world countries with these new, you know, these new materials, you've got to be sensitive because a lot of people have this knock test where they knock on it. If it sounds hollow, anything to do with it. I've seen this all over the place. This is the second house we built. These are some visits when I came back after the houses were built. All right, so let me step ahead. And so now I'm in Sri Lanka. I've spent all this time. I'm, I'm witnessing hundreds of millions of dollars being wasted. And I'm, I'm pissed. I'm pissed that these, these organizations, some of these big organizations, are, um, can't seem to pull their act together. Now, most of them aren't these large-scale developers. They don't have the experience to build these buildings. You know, they're, they're aid organizations. They're used to putting Band-Aids on people's arms, giving you a bottle of water, patting you on your back, and sending you on your way. You know, they're not like the Pultis of the, of the world where they have the, the means to build big, you know, developments and stuff. It's exciting. Plastic cardboard. The old canvas tent. More tents. People will have to live in this stuff. This is what, this is what th you get. This guy was so upset. The symbol on the wall is um, USAID. The other symbol says CHF, Cooperative Housing Foundation. Now again, I mean, it's, it's something, but it's, it, well, we could do so much better as architects and engineers. Give me a break, come on. I mean, some of these people were, were, were are expected to live in these things for six, six months, 18 months, two years. So while I was there, you know, you're talking about, you know, keeping your mind open up. You never know when opportunity is going to present yourself. You see something and you react. And this was my reaction. I said, wouldn't it be great for us to be able to come up with, you know, a shelter 
that has the ability to convert to a permanent home and in a way that you don't have to waste anything. So my partner and I um, built, some, built the structure. It's a prototype. And we just we covered it with a, um, with, with a uh, polyethylene tarp. I mean, this is a prototype. You know, we hadn't even designed all of our coverings yet, but I wanted to prove the concept. And so the concept is, is that from a shelter, you can then convert it to a permanent home by adding components from stuck on steel, other technology that we've added. And so you don't throw anything away. What a great, what a great thing. You know, in Haiti right now, there's a company, I won't mention any names, it's a $1,000 tent, $1,000. I mean, a, a shelter frame is about, about $1,500. But what you get with the shelter frame, you get part of the structure. So would you rather spend $1,000 and know that you're going to throw that all the way, or maybe spend a little bit more and know you're going to have something that can be something else and not be thrown away? That's what Sheltered Home is all about. That's the mall's mom. The mall's mom was about this tall. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a picture of her standing next to her. It's like, yeah. And she's tall for a Sri Lankan. I went back, and I'll tell you um, with, a, with, a, with a cheer jerking moment when um, I, this is two years after I, you know, so I've seen Namal a couple of times, but I went back and saw him. It, it's just, it was just overwhelming. I mean, this is why, you know, this is why I'm, I'm so fortunate and so blessed to be, you know, able to share this with you because it, you know, these are opportunities that are out there waiting for you. You know, positively affect, positively affect people. What? Um, I jumped around here. I want to make sure I get back on track here. Okay. So, again, what, what the concept is is these shelters that um, over time can be added. What you see on the top, there's like this utility group. It's like it's a toilet, it's a shower, it's a kitchen, it's a fireplace. And it's, a, it's more of a permanent structure. You don't build it as a, uh, as a shelter because it's got to be, you know, it's got to do more things than, than just keep you out of the rain. And so you can relocate your shelter to, you know, your, where your utility group is, you know, so you can change sites and stuff. And eventually, over time, you know, you can uh, make it permanent. This is, um, this is kind of a front and back. Um, we're building one of these houses for the government of Haiti. Um, this is the model that were designed for the government of Haiti, um, and then I think in May, for a competition. It's an exposition. It's called the Build Back better communities. It's, um, Ministry of Tourism is sponsoring this. And so we were selected to demonstrate our technology. There's a little nice little rendering of it. You know, see the solar panel at the top. Um, you can do water collection. Um, there's that water. There's a 500 liter water tank in the back. You know, just, you know, little off the grid little unit. So <clears throat> we're talking about reach. So back in um, Back when I made my first trip, I made my first trip to see Father Mark. Father Mark runs this orphanage down in, in, in Lakai. Lakai is in the south, about five hours away from, from Port-au-Prince. And um, takes care of 600 kids, 1,200 meals, um, meals a day, 3,500 meals a day, 1,200 kids. And so what we thought was to try to collaborate with Father Mark and all his orphan youth that were coming of age, coming of 18, being 18. And, they had to get kicked out of the orphanage. So we saw an opportunity to not only come in and partner and, and build some houses, and I'll show them to you next, and that's how Lawrence Tech is involved, but also to do some job training. And so now our company, from a, a socially conscious standpoint, we're engaged in providing uh, job training for the kids that are coming out. So I think about it, these kids that you know, are, are saved by a priest, fed, educated, clothed, taken care of for all this time. Once they hit 18, they get kicked out. You know, it's, they fall victim to 70% unemployment. The chance of these kids of, of becoming anybody or anything is, 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 is like winning the lottery. You know, it's just not going to happen. And so our company comes in, and we now, we, now we're engaged in doing this, um, doing training. So it, it, that's an incredible opportunity. So service learning and leadership, that's what, that's what REACH and Lawrence Tech is working. Just read through those. It's, it's really to provide, it says seniors, this was for another um, presentation I did for some high school students, but um, it's really to provide students with an opportunity to go abroad, serve, learn, and lead. And, and what you can do is um, um, you, you can pick a project and, um, 
and, and you can engage, reach, and, and help develop the project. I'm not going to get too much in because I could, I could spend an hour just talking about that. I'll just show you some photos. Kip, you see yourself? Talk about tying rebar. She did a great job. She showed the boy, got down in the trenches and showed it. Christine just uh, is amazing. She, uh, a woman in the trenches. This is not something that you see every day in Haiti. A woman working, doing, doing construction labor. And this stuff changes your life. You know, you're working for these girls. Those are, that's our, those are our clients. I mean, how can you not go to Haiti and, and volunteer for a week? And, and you feel good about it. These are the, some of the guys that helped us lay the foundations. So students here from Lawrence Tech went down. They laid the foundations for these houses. But I just want to show you some pictures. <coughs> this is Haiti pre-earthquake. That's an entire family, by the way. Can you design something that, that might be a little bit better than that? This is a median. This is on the way to, uh, this is on the way to um, Lakai, so it's heading south. There's a median, and the median is, is all these temporary shelters. We'd be whizzing by 50 miles an hour. There'd be a little girl, a little boy sitting on the curb. I mean, you're flying by 60 miles an hour. They're like five feet away. The devastation, it, you get to a point where you're, you're numb. It doesn't really mean it, it's, it's everywhere. 80% of the rubble is still in place, I would say. It, more, most of the people are still buried. Very sad. And the tents are, are everywhere. Tell you a little bit about, real quickly, what we're doing. Um, we've got a couple projects that we're doing. Um, different houses, um, different schools that we're building. Uh, it's a great opportunity to, I mean, you're building houses for people that are displaced by the earthquake and schools that will, will, will educate young minds. Rewarding stuff. <coughs> I talked about this training program. This is part of our crew. There's Sam in the back. There's me kneeling down. Um, the guy on the left is a, a high school friend of mine. is a master plumber. Brought him down there to do some plumbing training. So if you got have a skill, you want to come down and you want to you know, give something back, come on down and we can, you can use your skills training other people. There's another crew. Part of our, our program is, is that we take crews from one region and we bring them into the other region, so we do community building. You know, it's, it's, it's not a bunch of Americans coming in and fixing it for Haiti. It's about Americans coming in, showing them how to fix it, and then letting them fix it themselves. So the guys in the back um, are training the guys in the front. This is some of our roll forming equipment. I don't get too much into it. This is our facility in Winchester. This is the machinery that makes all these components. You turn on the machine, once all the design done, you tell it, make it, it'll make it whether you like it or not. Makes it consistently and persistently day after day. Doesn't complain or whine. You know, it shows up on time. It's exciting. So these are the products we sent um, down there. That's me on the upper right. You know, and again, it's all about training. Training them to, sh to do it. And then they go out and do it, putting these houses together. The structures go up relatively quick. I mean, you can put a house together in a, in a day. You know, it's about a three bedroom house. The roof's a panel. Everything's a panel. Panels are easier. Here's the plumbing. There's Brendan. So I talked about um, strength. So this is a, a, a little footing detail. So we've got the slab being poured on the right-hand side, and it's coming through one of our interior non-bearing partition walls. And so you can see this horizontal um, stud that's going all the way around, kind of like 12 inches above the bottom of the plate. That's going to be the bottom of the slab. And here's Rico there. He's placing all, all the cement. By burying all the framing, I guarantee you my building's not going to blow away or it's going to fall down in an earthquake. So that's why we're able to say our buildings are highly resistant to earthquake and hurricanes and stuff. Our guys are trained to put the stucco on the outside, on the inside, and those are houses. Those are the foundations that Kip and Christine, Sam, Kevin, and couple others uh, help build. And they're home for 45 orphan girls. There are some of them right there. Look at those faces. Come on down to Haiti. It'll change your life. So these are the weeks. And you can get onto our website. Uh, it's www. I'll, I'll show it up here. It's www.reachforchildren.org. Uh, you can contact Melissa Grinnell 
um, and she will definitely hook you up. So if you come down this summer, I'm going to show you who you're going to be building for. This is a father, father of five. This is where he's living. We're going to be building him a house. And um, or you can help me finish her house. This, you know, this poor lady lost her leg in the earthquake, lost her husband, lost a, a child. Her daughter's right there. And um, I tell you, you meet people like this and, and you see, you know, I was introduced as the president of the company and it's all, you know, it, it's, it's, it titled to me that is nothing but to her. It was like, it, it was a great moment in her day to meet me and stuff. And I tell you, it was a humbling experience to meet her. And I, I think I got more out of it than she did. Here's another mother of three, divorced. A lot of the men abandon the women as soon as they have kids and they just move on. But um, these are some houses that we have under construction. So if you come on down, you're going to help build one of these houses. They go up in about 10 days. So why do I say 10%? 10%. 10 give 10%. I'm not talking about money. If you got it, give it. But if you got the time, most of us have more time than money. Give 10% of your time. Figure out a way to you know, share your talents, your abilities. You know, give it back. Um, but make sure you do it in a way that is sustainable. I mean, I'm not about, I'm not a Band-Aid guy. You know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna help, figure out how to look at the wound and, and, and be like a surgeon and, and suture it up and then figure out if there's long-term care or therapy that's needed. Okay, putting more Band-Aids on it just doesn't do it. So just think about, you know, sustainability could be, you know, just training or transferring some ideas. All right, so in conclusion, create a mission statement. We talked about that. Have balance in everything you do. Be open to being an entrepreneur because these opportunities are going to come to you. And if you're not paying attention and the, light, and the light's not on at home, it's going to come right by you. You know, take a chance. I took many. And um, you know, now I'm in, a, you know, we're in this great position. You know, and, and along the way, I'm going to figure out a way to give 10% back, whether it's through REACH or some other organization. So I thank you very much for your time. It's been a great day. questions that can be asked, but I think you can see why the Legends of Lawrence Tech awarded Donald A. Stevens the Legend of the Year Award for 2009-2010. He is a legend, and we certainly recognize him, his outstanding achievement, and he's one of our own, a Lawrence Tech grad. We're very, very proud of your accomplishments and what you've done, and the message that you've delivered here today. It's a very valuable lesson. And uh, I'd like to turn this over back to, uh, to you, and uh, you can ask, ask some questions if you'd like, or uh, we certainly would like to hear from you. I have two questions. So one is um, obviously very impressive what you're doing. <laughs> have you had your structures, you showed us how you're tying them into the foundation. Have you had them like earthquake rated or um, Hurricane rated, I mean, test it so you can say yes, this it's a, is what it can withstand? Yeah, it's a couple hundred thousand on a test, and the answer is no. Um, what we've done is we've been able to take what the industry done. Like, like I said, I, I, invented, I didn't invent the tire, I invented the tread. So when it comes to steel framing, and, I, and I'm not an engineer, so I have to speak on another little level. So I can tell you that is that um, we follow very strict you know, um, um, codes uh, how we frame. You know, so we're following the standards, 16 inches on center. The tensile strength of the steel can do so many things. We run all the calculations based on everything. So our calculations tell us what we can and cannot do. You know, so, you know, Haiti's a very active place, a lot of wind, a lot of ground shaking. So, you know, we just rely on, our, on, on good engineering, solid engineering to, to um, tell us, you know, how far we can take our materials. But eventually, I mean, the, the testing is very expensive. And at the end of the day, I'll tell you this, you know, it's great. I could, I could say to you, yeah, yeah, we got all of our certification. But I go down to Haiti, and would they put it together the way it's supposed to be? And the answer is no, without major supervision. And so, you know, just because you have a certification, you know, it, it doesn't give you license, to, you know, pretty much. I mean, it says, it says you can meet these things, but once you get into the field, especially in a country like Sri Lanka or something, there's so many variables going on, even like how they mix the concrete, which is done all on the ground, not coming out of a out of a truck, out of a batch out of a batching plant. 
And so it did, you know, so quick answer is, is you know, we haven't had all the testing yet. It's very expensive. The other question was, is Sri Lanka and Haiti the only two countries that you're, you're doing these types of structures? Or are there other countries that have reached out to you? I mean, I, I don't know if you get contacted nowadays when you see what happens in Japan, because you're talking about shelters, so. Right, right now, you know, I got started in Sri Lanka. Um, we had a, a huge investment in Sri Lanka, and the last time I was in there, a uh, suicide bomber detonated a bus outside my hotel, blew up 20-some people, and I left. I left the next day. And, um, you know, we spent about a year in India, another tough market to be in, but everything was lining up. After 2008, four consecutive hurricanes, we went to Haiti. We're not a big company. We're a small company. We have seven employees. We got about 50 to 60 guys, depending on the day, in Haiti employed right now. And, and shelter home technology is relatively new. And that's what I've, even though the, I've been around since 2002, we haven't had a chance to expand. But, you know, 70% of the world is, is a potential market. And I hope to be in 70% of the world one day. I don't know if it's going to be me, though. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. When you build your stucco, where, where do you get the materials? Do you sand, or? sand, cement, and water. And some proprietary admixtures, and we have to bring that in from the states. We try to source locally because that's you know part of sustainable. I don't want to be shipping in cement from the United States if I could buy it there in Haiti. You know the sand is is all plenty of sand in Haiti, plenty of rock, lots of it. So and and, and just on some of the other materials that we use, like windows and doors, you know we try to source as much as we can in Haiti. But there's limited manufacturing in Haiti because there's no industry. You know, about seven years ago, it all went down the toilet. Uh, can you speak to the challenges of the foreign uh, company setting up an actual business in Haiti? Okay. Uh, um, you know, we were in a we were an interesting spot because three months before the earthquake, we actually got incorporated. What I can do in the United States in 24 hours took me almost six months to do. And I had the best, I had one of the best attorneys. And that wasn't what I thought, that's what the State Department told me. It's like, and I was like, wow, I got the best attorney, State Department says. And um, it's, 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 you know, it's, you know, now I can't speak for all countries because it was a little bit different in Sri Lanka, you know, but um, there's a lot of problems in Haiti, you know, politically speaking. And right after the earthquake, you, know, you had major government buildings collapsed. I mean, the Ministry of Finance, where I was just, you know, months earlier, was, was pancaked. You know, and um, you know all that was gone, and um, so you know it can take it can take months to to do things. You know, we've been um, we've been engaged. Yeah, I made my first trip to Haiti in February 2009. I just got back on on Tuesday night. This is my 19th trip, and um, you know you got to be patient. You know you have to be persistent, and you you know, and it, it, it costs a lot of money. And a lot of, and, and Sam says, you know, a lot of this stuff is relationship building. You know, people, people want to feel good about you. There's a lot of fly-by-night people. And, um, you know, a lot of people come down and promise the sun, the moon, and the stars, and then they don't deliver, you know, one speck of anything. And, um, you know, it's like, it, you know, my reputation, people are just like, yeah, he just keeps showing up. I mean, he just, just keeps showing up. 19 trips, it's like, come on, this guy, you know, we're going to have to give him something because we, they start, feel sorry for me. <laughs> just kidding. But, um, you know, so I hope I answered your question, Kip. But it's, 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 it is, um, it's a, you know, get a good attorney. Stick close to the U.S. Embassy. There's an econ office um, that is there to, per, to help you the best they can. They're not there to promote your business. They're not there to give you an, a leg up. You know, they're just there to support you. Uh, and also, yeah, Amcham, good one. Uh, American Chamber of Commerce, another organization to touch, touch, but you can learn more about this. Way up in the